welcome uh, everybody. Really nice to see you. I know it's uh, the holidays are around the corner and it's a busy time as we wind down for that. Uh, so I do hope that everyone gets a chance or starting to uh, really focus on and, and invest time with family and friends. Um, so nice to see you all. Uh, so to uh, formally start, uh, just a couple things, uh, please know, and, and you would have gotten the no notification that uh, the uh, meeting is being recorded. Um, please mute your device uh, if you're able to, and you know we'll have opportunities for questions and feedback. Um, and I will let you know that I've had a lot of issues this morning with my connection. Uh, I've been dropping off a lot from calls. Uh, so if I do that, Michelle and others may be able to jump in and support in that. Uh, and I'll try to come back as quickly as possible. So just an FYI there. Uh, so I guess we can get started with an official, uh, with, with, with our lane acknowledgement. So we will begin by acknowledging that Windsor occupies the traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of the Nishwi, Ishkadawan, and Anishinaabeg, the Three Fires Confederacy comprised of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. We acknowledge the land and the surrounding waters for sustaining us, and we work to stand together in commitment to protect and restore them from environmental degradation. We further acknowledge our collective commitment and responsibility to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 calls to action. As we gather at our, uh, at our council meetings to enhance positive and meaningful outcomes for residents in our region, with and with, uh, with and within the systems of education, employment, healthcare, government, justice, child welfare, and human and social services. Let us never forget that that work is incomplete if it does not seek to face and reconcile our past as a nation and the past of those systems in particular towards the creation of a more just and equitable future for Indigenous peoples in the whole of our society. So next up on our agenda is the review of our September 14th, 2021 meeting notes. Those were shared out ahead of uh, time. Hopefully you've had a chance to review. Uh, so I'm just gonna give a quick minute here for anyone that has any um, feedback, uh, feedback, comments, uh, amendments for those minutes. Seeing and hearing none, uh, I think we'll go ahead and consider those approved. Again, they were shared prior, so hopefully everyone's had a chance. Um, and then we can jump right in. As always, um, it is a busy time, so we appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to be with us. Uh, we have lots of great speakers and lots of uh, great information to share. Um, and we're going to get started with our uh, Windsor Essex Community Foundation, uh, so the Vital Signs Report Back. And we have Lisa Colodi joining us from uh, the foundation to present some of uh, the reports, findings. Lisa, nice to see you. Welcome. Hi, Hugo. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, good. If I drop today, well, Michelle can jump in as well. <laughs> Michelle's like, what? <laughs> um, thanks, Hugo, and congratulations on the new role. And um, I'd like to um, thank you for the opportunity to chat with you all today. We're going to chat a little bit about vital signs. Um, I think that it's something that everyone's quite familiar with by now, um, but we really appreciate the opportunity to highlight a little bit of the findings and we're gonna walk through it um, very quickly. I am joined today by Sal Mislovich, who will be handling the PowerPoint for me and Hallie Westwood, who's also on the line and our new communications person at the Windsor Essex Community Foundation. So. Um, every year we work closely with community and with our partners to implement our vital signs program. And uh, we use this program to look at a survey, do data collection, and we publish the report and we share this data. And we've been doing this for almost 10 years in Windsor, Essex. Um, so we appreciate all our community partners who have agreed to assist us in this. As you all know, uh, we do this as part of a larger collaborative and community. And, and, the Workforce Windsor Essex, the LIP, and all the partners around the table are part of that community. So I wanna thank you all who took the time to do the survey. Um, takes a little bit of energy, but we really appreciate it because it really helps us to create this report. And thanks again today to Workforce Windsor Essex and to the Windsor Essex Local Immigration Partnership for this opportunity to chat today. So um, we will have an opportunity for questions at the end, but if you have comments or questions along the way, please feel free to put them in the chat. And if I don't see them, someone else can uh, prompt me. And we really want this to be an opportunity to ask questions and make this a report that's usable for you. So if you don't really know us, um, 
My name is Lisa Clody, and the Windsor Essex Community Foundation is here to um, invest in community. So our philosophy is to inspire philanthropy, to benefit our community today and forever. And we accomplish this by attracting and managing legacy funds, making community investments to our local charities, and bringing community partners together. Last year alone, we were able to grant $2.2 million to local charities in Windsor and Essex County. So the Vital Signs Program is a report that we publish annually. And we really do this because what we hear from community, from donors, is that they really want our work to be grounded in data. And not only do we want data, we want to hear from community. And that is what makes our report and our program unique is we ask the broader community, what do you feel? What do you need? What are your priorities? So Vital Signs is a snapshot of life in Windsor, Essex that uses local research and data to measure the vitality of our community. By identifying trends and areas of need in 11 key issue areas, Vital Signs touches on all aspects of our daily lives and focuses on our overall sense of belonging. Each year we publish the Vital Signs Report as an informational resource for community. We use this as an opportunity to share what the community says makes Windsor Essex a great place to live, work, play, and grow. The report helps us to build community knowledge, inform our community investments, and identify strategic priorities. Many organizations have shared with us how they have used the report to assist in the work that they are doing. We hope that you'll be able to use this resource as well, and we encourage you to share your story with us if you do. So as I mentioned, the Vital Signs Report compares data from our Vital Signs Survey, which we implement in the spring, with data from national, provincial, and local sources. It lets us know how our community feels and what the data and the statistics tell us. That is why it's such a vital component of the program. No other report in Windsor Essex provides this type of data annually, as well as includes community feedback. The report explores 11 different issue areas. And we focus on these 11 areas because we feel they're all important to our quality of life in Windsor Essex. In other communities, they might choose to focus on one issue area, but for now we continue to explore all 11. So let's review some highlights from this year's report. So how you read the report has stayed the same. We try to keep it consistent so that we're able to um, explore the issues annually, but do comparisons from year to year. So we talk about grades um, and we have grades from A to F. Um, a is we're doing great. B is we're on the right track. C means we're doing okay, but we could be doing better. And when you look at the report, you'll see a lot of C's. So in our community, we feel, you know what, we're doing okay, but we could be doing better. Then we identify top priorities. And this is the feedback from community to say, in this area, this is something that I think we need to explore more. Then we have a section called what you said, where we look at the highlights from the respondents. And another important part for us is the did you know section. And under did you know, we highlight some in interesting facts related to the information presented and also what's happening in the community. Because what we find is sometimes people aren't aware of all the great work that's being done to address some of these issue areas. So on the next slide, we'll talk about how each page is laid out. So this is what around food security, where we look at what our priorities are, what, what the highlights of what the respondents say, some more stats and, and um, some did you knows looking at some of the great work happening, say under food security, what's happening with the Ontario Gleaners, the new farmers markets, all the markets that are included in the community as well as the stats. We found that this year again, respondents answers in the what you said section continue to be generally positive. 
This means that our survey respondents felt mostly optimistic about the quality of life in our community. Youth responses continue to be the most positive when, when it comes to the quality of life in Windsor-Essex. I think that's good news for all of us. Overall, our youth rated many issue areas as being on the right track. And lastly, and most noticeably are the grades. The report is telling us that Windsor-Essex is doing okay when it comes to quality of life, but there is still some room for improvement. So let's take a minute to look at our work page within the 2021 uh, report. So once again, we, we show um, what some of the top priorities are, and we're gonna talk about that more in the next slide. Some, some data and stats on what respondents, uh, how they responded to the questions, some of the good projects that's happening, and then um, some of the stats around uh, work. On the next slide, we're going to talk about priorities. So um, one of the things that we find interesting is look from year to year to see if there's any shifts in priority, priorities or consistencies. So you can see in 2016, the top priority was decreasing the unemployment rate and then ensuring graduates are better prepared for the workforce and then ensuring success of new businesses. By 2019, the top priority had became providing a living wage to employees. And if you'll notice in 2016, that didn't fit in the top three priorities. Then decreasing the unemployment rate and then providing more support to local businesses. This year, our top priorities were providing a living wage to employees, ensuring our youth are better prepared for the workforce and decreasing the unemployment rate. The next slide is on belonging and leadership. So again, we look at what the priorities are, what the community is saying. And, and we have traditionally found that under belonging and leadership, we have some of the highest scores where we find that the community feels that there are opportunities for life satisfaction, people feel connected to their communities. And then we highlight some of the good work that's happening in the community around belonging and leadership. For the priorities, once again, we take a look at priorities over time. In 2016, increasing opportunities for people to feel included and connected is the top priority. And if you look across, you'll see that that has been a top priority every year since 2016, as well as providing more initiatives to increase life satisfaction and creating initiatives to improve to voter turnout. So while the percentages move slightly, those continue to be the top three priorities under belonging and leadership. And the last page is getting started. And everyone has received a, pay, a copy of Vital Signs um, through um, Workforce Windsor Essex and the WeLip um, mail out. So we thank you for sharing them so you can dig deeper on these pages, as well as we'll be sending the PowerPoint afterwards. So again, we take a look at what the top priorities are, what people have said, and um, some of the DG knows and some of the good work that's been happening in community. And looking again at um, some of the priorities around getting started. In 2016, the top priority was increasing employment and educational opportunities for newcomers. The second one was increasing awareness of racism and diversity issues. And then the third was improving foreign accreditation recognition. By 2020, our top priorities are increasing awareness of racism and diversity issues, increasing employment and educational opportunities for newcomers, and improving foreign accreditation recognition. So you can see over the years some of the shifts in the priorities, um, as well as some consistencies that come from year to year. Um, so while we publish vital signs every year, we share it with community. You'll also see now we're uh, putting out social media posts and continuing the conversation. We know that this is high level data. We, we encourage you to share it um, as you need, but we also would like to dig deeper in some of those issue areas. So we are planning to do some vital conversations in 2022. 
And uh, we will be doing them with our partners at Libro and looking deeper into some of these issue areas, pulling community partners around the table and exploring some of these issue areas and seeing if there's ways that we can help move the needle and help improve community on some of these different um, issue areas and continue that conversation. So this, this concludes the formal part of our presentation. We've left a few minutes for any conversations or comments. If anybody has any questions for me or anything they'd like to discuss further about the report. Mary Ellen, I see your hand up, you wanna jump in? Thanks. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Lisa, that was really good. Um, I certainly see a lot of common answers over the years. Can you kind of identify um, some areas that you think Windsor's really starting to uh, improve in, as opposed to kind of, you know, they surface, the numbers alter a little bit, but is there, are there any areas where we really seem to be showing some real improvement? Sure, that's a great question, Marion. Thank you. Um, yes, so I think, we found some, um, some positive responses from seniors. There are some areas that continue to be challenging, but we've also seen some programs and initiatives that are helping seniors become more engaged and feel a better sense of belonging. As we mentioned earlier, we are seeing our youth are um, on average responding more positively and saying, you know, we think we're doing okay. Um, one of the worst areas is, is housing. And, and I don't think that's a surprise to anyone that has a consistent, consistently received an F rating, um, especially this year. Um, and, and you saw at the beginning, we, are, we break our answers into youth, seniors, Windsor, and then the county. And we're trying to in, increase our, our response rate in the county, but you often have a different experience depending on where you are, whether that's in your age or where you live, so we try to break it down a little bit that way. We also want to emphasize that a C rating is still, we're doing okay. There's just room for improvement. So sometimes people see a C and think that's a bad score. And we would argue that and say, you know what? It's not a bad score. It's actually pretty good. It's just, there's an opportunity for improvement. We have seen um, increasing scores uh, before COVID in food security. So there was a sense that um, some of the systems in place were working, but there was more interest in the availability of local food. I think especially recognizing the community we're in, where uh, many of us have access to local food, but there is an opportunity for more people to have that kind of access. As I mentioned, sense of belonging continues to be a, a space where the scores consistently are higher, where people feel a real sense of belonging to their community and really feel positive about that. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Mary. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Uh, and Ronnie, you have uh, your hand up as well. Yep. And thank you, Hugo. Lisa, that was very, very interesting. I uh, thank you for sharing it with us. And I really like how you broke it down. But I'm curious, like, you know, in this theme of breaking it down, uh, like, you know, university students would be very, very interested with this information. Uh, newcomers, uh, specifically, like for me, I'm thinking about the the Islamic community uh, would be would be interested. So I'm thinking, like, is there outreach with all these different groups, and is there this um, desire to to break it down even further? Because you know, a sense of belonging for an international student might be a little bit different than a sense of belonging for a newcomer with a family. So um, I, I think this is great, but I think, you know, there's a lot that we can potentially build on if we target certain groups to make sure that there is a very balanced um, uh, reflection of, of, of responses. Um, excellent uh, point. And I agree with you completely. We would love to dig deeper into a variety of communities. We do the out, best outreach we can with a team of three and four. Uh, but if we can have further conversations with anyone around this table to help share the survey, it does take 15 to 20 minutes. We have done specific outreach through um, this partnership who has always been supportive to us. Um, but you know, we do need to do that. We have moved completely um, digital. And so we try to do it as best as we can. 
pre-COVID, we would go out to agencies and we would bring paper copies if needed. So uh, I'd love to have that conversation with you to find ways that we can um, help promote the survey more, increase our um, response rate, and dig it deep into certain communities and explore that further. Um, as I said, we did that for a while with Life After 15, the seniors population. We had to bring in kind of paper and chat about why we were doing it and then bring the hard copies back. Now that we're digital, we could just find new ways to do that. So happy to explore that with you more, Ronnie. And thank you for saying C is not a bad grade. If you can talk to my parents, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Ronnie, I, I had the same thought. I'm like, I guess someone told me that in university. Um, although that might be a different context. Um, <laughs> um, I will say that, as always, and you mentioned this, Lisa, uh, the, the LIP was always going to be willing to support in any way that we can, uh, you know, in future uh, reports, uh, surveys, or any uh, conversations in between. Um, so just looking at the time, I know there's two more hands up. So we have Peter and Marcella. Uh, so we'll probably make those the last two questions or comments. So Peter, I think you're up first. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation there, Lisa. Um, I know that uh, as you were speaking, you, you, you sort of spoke very quickly about uh, decreasing the unemployment rate, uh, which was um, uh, one of, um, you know, I guess uh, uh, the top priorities or the top three priorities in the, the years that you mentioned. And I know that there's a study that just came out of the University of Windsor to, uh, suggesting that um, um, uh, black males uh, in Windsor were uh, the, the most affected uh, by unemployment. And I, I, I suppose the, um, um, uh, one of the, uh, the, the covers that we have now is because of the COVID uh, pandemic. And so, you know, we can uh, attribute that to COVID uh, to a certain extent. Uh, but I, I'd, I'd like to hear more when you have time. What waves um, do you think that you've made uh, with uh, the, the notion of decreasing unemployment? Um, yeah, unemployment is a complex issue uh, today as well as during COVID and after COVID and back into COVID. Um, and as a community foundation, we're really trying through this report to reflect the community's emphasis and priorities. So again, with it being uh, a lower priority than increasing the living wage, it doesn't mean it's not a priority. Um, but as we watch our unemployment rate uh, kind of go up and down, um, it is something that we are using to talk to um, stakeholders and community members and decision makers and the broader community to say, these are areas we need to explore deeper. Um, and as a community foundation, I mentioned at the beginning, part of what we do is look for opportunities to support good projects in community. So I think if you see this report, you know about organizations doing work that supports these issue areas. If you um, use the report to help us understand why it's a priority, it's opportunities for us to invest further. So um, we know that uh, racialized communities, different communities need more supports and it's something that we continue to look at supporting on an ongoing basis. And we like to include those other reports as well. So we have even more basis for support. So I'd be happy to um, look at that report, Peter, if I can if you can send it to our attention, we can maybe include something around that next year. All right, thank you. Thanks, Peter. Great question. Uh, and Marcella? Thank you so much. And so, uh, so good to see you, Lisa. Yes. And thank you so very much for the report. Yes. So a bit coming back in regarding to Ronnie's comment, and yes, it's so good to see the um, increase in welcoming and sense of belonging. So, um, so just it will be very interesting in regarding to follow up. So many about more than 10, 10 years ago, um, I think MCC um, together with uh, the University of Windsor, and I believe it was WILIP as well, we were involved in a research, right? Looking at how welcoming Windsor Wessex was. And it will be, I think, a very interesting to to maybe do such a research again um, in regarding to, like Ronnie was mentioning, in regard, perhaps in regarding to the, you know, breaking down according to the eth ethnic or ethnocultural communities and seeing and seeing is how is that is also impacting um, um, communities who are uh, uh, um, 
you know, visible minorities, the Black African communities, or others who may be marginalized in regarding. So I, I think that will be something maybe a consideration. Thank you so very much. So many avenues of potential research to further um, ex explore your the findings and the vital signs. Thanks, Marcella. Uh, yes, this is a start of a conversation. And as a community foundation, we like to help bring people together to um, look at some of these issues. We do not have the answers. You all have the answers. We are just helping to find the resources. Uh, I would encourage everyone to join our, um, our newsletter to see uh, what opportunities arise. Use vital signs when you are looking at opportunities for supports to um, help to say that you know this is a need in the community. And if you are looking to have further deeper conversations on any of these issues, please feel free to reach out to the Windsor Essex Community Foundations and we'd be happy to continue that conversation. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we're looking at two in, in the new year um, with Libro and we hope that that will be another opportunity for us to dig deeper on some of these issues. So thank you so very much everyone for your time. It's great to see so many friendly faces around the room and uh, I hope you all have a good um, holiday, however you uh, choose to celebrate. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lisa, and to all the questions. Uh, I will point everyone's attention to uh, the chat as well. Uh, Rakesh uh, and uh, through the chamber, and I'm sure through other uh, means, willing to support very much this work and the conversations. Massive champion in the community, of course, so no surprise there, but um, great that uh, he's always present and uh, willing to support. So thank you for that, Rakesh. Um, and thank you, Lisa, for the presentation. Uh, so just before we move on, um, uh, I know uh, by now Zoom is kind of our, our go-to for most of our life, but uh, if anyone needs the, the reminder at the top right um, hand corner of your screen, there is a view option that allows you to change the view to either have uh, the speaker um, showing and the presentation or uh, the, um, uh, kind of the, uh, the list of individuals, the attendees, I forget the, um, the term for that. So anyways, you have options there if, if, if one is more comfortable and more conducive to uh, the presentation. So uh, next on our agenda, uh, we have uh, Ines uh, Abdallah from the VON Immigrant Health Clinic, nurse practitioner uh, there uh, to present us on their work. Ines, I think you have the floor. Just doing a double check here. So we uh, see your screen share, um, but I, I, I at least am not um, able to hear you if you started speaking. Oh, no, I haven't started speaking. Sorry, I haven't okay. done what in many of these presentations. So no problem, just check. Uh, can you see the presentation? Uh, so we're actually seeing your, um, your uh, the PowerPoint sort of, uh, uh, actually, if you go to the display settings, yep. Yeah, uh, and then you there should, if you click on that, can swap oh. and then, yeah there you go that's good okay, perfect thank you so much so uh, as Hugo said my name is Inas Abdullah I'm a nurse practitioner with the V1 Immigrant Health Clinic um, I have been there since 2016 uh, just a little bit after they started um, they started in April um, for anybody who calls our phone number now uh, we will be answering as the V1 NP clinic because we uh, we're housing two of VON's clinic, the Immigrant Health and the Francophone Clinic. So I'll get into that a little bit. Um, if anybody, for those who haven't heard, we have moved. Um, uh, and so our new location is on the corner of uh, um, Tecumseh Road East and McDougall. Uh, right behind the 7-Eleven, we are in the Elite Medical Building. Um, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a digital tour. So there's the main entrance. Right there. And that's us. We're at unit 160. Hmm. Went too much. Okay, so uh, we moved back in uh, the beginning of July. Uh, it's taken some time to adjust, but we are fully adjusted now and very grateful to be able to be presenting to you, giving you a little bit of an update. 
So uh, the clinic concept, we worked through, we worked through this committee actually to develop um, uh, the clinic. Um, it was developed in 2016 when the Syrian crisis for, was first, um, where all of the Syrian refugees were first coming to Windsor. Um, and we have expanded since then covering all types of um, refugees, immigrants, and anybody who needs help really. Some of our goals are to provide um, coordination and access to primary care services, including ourselves as the immigrant health clinic. We do do primary care as well, uh, primarily to uh, immigrants, refugees, um, and uh, it includes a lot of mental health. We, ref uh, we refer patients to primary care uh, through a clinical connect process. Our goal is to create a warm and welcoming um, environment for our people who have no idea where they're going really um, so that they can be comfortable and when they become comfortable we are able to address their immediate health concerns um, chronic concerns help them with referrals prescriptions and whatnot we work really hard on trying to create a nice rapport with patients to make them feel comfortable enough to do so we provide lots of education on healthy living and wellness provide information on healthcare. Um, in the community of Windsor Essex. Um, again, with our goals is continuing to provide primary care. And then additionally, when we were looking at uh, places to move, um, we wanted to facilitate easy access to other healthcare services. So currently in our new location, it's on a popular bus route, very central location. Um, many of our clients actually have um, been so happy that they're very, it's very easy to get to us. Uh, there is a walk-in clinic in the building. There's a CMR imaging um, uh, in the building. There's a pharmacy, physiotherapy, uh, cardiologist right next door. Uh, the VON pain clinic is also housed in the same building. Um, and the lab is a five-minute drive. And from what I understand, they're looking at getting a lab within the building as well. So it's like a one-stop shop, very easy for our clients, especially those who are coming very new and don't know how to navigate around the city yet. A little bit about our team. Um, uh, we have myself. I'm one of the nurse practitioners here. We have Jill Best, who I'm going to introduce right now. Turn to her. Hello, everyone. She's a Francophone Clinic NP. We have a medical receptionist, Reem, who uh, is not here uh, to introduce at the moment. We have a team of registered practical nurses that come on a day-to-day -day basis, um, mental health counselors through family services, as well as through the community, uh, our clinical manager, educator, and uh, NP professional practice director. Okay, about us and our services. We are funded by the LIN, operational since 2016. We're almost going on six years, which is crazy to think about. Uh, we don't do any OHIP billing. Um, of course, if a patient does need lab work and referrals, that's a different story. But for our clinic, there is no OHIP billing. We provide a holistic client-centered assessment at each, uh, for each individual. Again, we help them help everybody maneuver through the healthcare system. Because even for people that have been here five plus, 10 plus, 20 plus years, it can get a little confusing. Um, education on personal care, healthy eating, and overall wellness. We do immunizing, immunization card translation. Um, now we can do those for all languages that use Latin letters. So those are the English letters uh, or Arabic. Um, unfortunately, it is difficult to do other languages that use um, like Mandarin lettering and things like that. Uh, ODSB self-report assistance, uh, so that is in Arabic only. So we have a uh, Practical, registered practical nurse who sits with the patient and helps them um, essentially put their thoughts and their feelings into words if they are unable to do so. Uh, mental health counseling through family services and other community resources, women's health assessments, physical exams, and primary care for all ages. Monday to Friday, nine to five, um, we do in-person virtual visits, so through a video. Uh, and phone visits. So the virtual and, in, and um, phone visits were very, very helpful during COVID and during the last two years. Um, 
and probably ongoing for people who didn't have cars, didn't have access to bus or when the bus routes were limited or closed or whatnot, we were still able to um, connect. We do have urgent appointments like same day for people who have been already registered with our clinic. So we know a little bit of about their backstory and that's less than 24 hours. And that just helps them, prevents them from going to the ER, waiting long hours. Um, I don't know if anyone's gone, hopefully not gone to the ER, it is always packed. Okay, um, we have a new simplified referral form. And just quickly, this referral form is just a guide to help caseworkers, counselors, family, friends, to help them ref like give us information to call, fill it out as best as you can. We really just need a name uh, and a phone number. Um, but if you can give us the rest of the information, it's great. We need one type of ID just so that we know that that is the right person. And we are accepting all types of patients regardless of status. Okay, just a little bit of a close up. One of our newest um, tools that we have in the clinic is was provided from the LIN initially, and it has helped us expand our services to many, many people who speak many different languages. It's called We Speak or Language Line Solutions. It takes a maximum of two minutes to a live interpreter. Um, as you can see here um, on the screen, there is Spanish, Arabic. Those are just the top. Um, but if I exit out of this screen and take you to their website, and just let me know if you can see the website. Okay, so I know that there is an increase in Afghani uh, or people from Afghanistan. So if we look up, um, I think the national language is Dari. There is right there. So in two minutes, um, yep. at least- Sorry, Inas, we can't see your screen. You'll have to, I think, stop, share, and reshare. For okay. the website. No problem. Learning experience right now. Okay, can <laughs> you see it now? Yep, that's it. Okay. So, like I said, here you can you see all of the top languages right here. And when you search, like I said, for Afghanistan, the top language, when I searched it up, it's Dari. Um, and then there is a little phone symbol, which means in about two minutes, I can connect to a live person who speaks Dari. Um, and we can help, it, it just helps that patient, um, regardless of their language, regard, help them communicate better to their primary care provider, to their NP, um, and in that way they can um, express themselves more clearly, and then I can help them get to their goals. Okay, I would actually test it, but I don't think it's fair to not give the person a little bit of a warning, so let's go back. Okay, I'm just gonna quickly ask that works or not really. You're good. Okay. Go in there. Okay, and then that's just a little bit of a picture here. It shows you, you actually get a full, like a person speaking directly to you. And of course, we always ask as best as we can, um, consent from the patient that, are you okay speaking to somebody else? And then each individual interpreter has an ID, which we add to their chart. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through some cases. Um, these are kind of outstanding cases. Uh, one is how we effectively used We Speak. Um, so we had a family come in and uh, we had a 14 year old girl with anxiety. It was a lot of new environment, new school. Um, I couldn't get too, too much out of her because I didn't, I don't speak Spanish, but with um, the We Speak interpreters, she was able to express um, what her uh, sources of anxiety were and with that we were able to connect her to family services because they also have interpretation and after six visits with me and many with mental health she was doing much better but this would have been much much more difficult if we didn't have we speak or the language line solutions okay uh, case number two here is a little bit different it just kind of uh, highlights how we've used different resources within our community a uh, 30 year old female, uh, disclaimer, these were slightly altered for confidentiality. Um, 
30 year old female with a five year old called crying to the clinic. She had created a rapport with me as her NP and didn't really feel comfortable calling anybody else. Almost felt like she needed permission to ask what she was asking for. Uh, she wanted help getting out of an abusive relationship. She wanted permission that she could call 911. Uh, she was scared to do so, so we kept her on the phone. We called her, and through the um, VON team, we were able to get her out of that home in less than 24 hours. I think it was actually like six hours, and he wasn't near anywhere near her at the time. Well, some of the community resources that we use were Victim Services, Nisa Homes, Hiatus House, Children's Aid, Children's First, and Community Psychiatrists, and many, many more. Okay, and at the end of the day, the important thing is the patient is safe. Case number three, um, our efforts with COVID, um, the, or I have done as the Immigrant Health NP, I've done the COVAX training through the Windsor Essex Community Health Unit. Um, and I was able to do education to one-on-one -on -one, um, because there was some hesitancy within the community, um, surprisingly, because um, being an Arabic background, what I find is we're very much into getting vaccinated. We want all the vaccines that there are available. But with COVID, there was some hesitation. So we were able to do one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, counseling regarding the vaccine in Arabic and other languages because of we speak. And uh, we've been doing clinics once monthly by appointment and we've been able to vaccinate over 40 people since uh, I think the end of September. Uh, so they are small clinics, but I mean, we're able to do the education and I find that it has helped people understand the vaccine more. Okay, that's a little bit about what we've been doing. Um, does anyone have any questions? And I will add, if anybody wants an in-person um, tour, you are more, wel more than welcome to call us. We'll give you a tour. Maybe we'll make some coffee. Give you a tingle to come to so it's all safe. I was just gonna thank you, Ines, for that uh, wonderful presentation, for the invitation. I would invite any of our members to take you up on that. Uh, it looks like a beautiful facility. Uh, amazing to still uh, have um, the VO and Immigrant Health Clinic after six years. I know for those mm -hmm. uh, of our members that know a bit of the history there, uh, it really was kind of a, a short-term pilot to start uh, and, you know, uncertain as to what the future would be. Um, but here we are six years later and doing amazing things and amazing plug in for as well for We Speak. Uh, so both the uh, Immigrant Health Clinic and We Speak are uh, things that uh, the WeLib have uh, helped support over the years. Mm -hmm. and, um, amazing to see that connection and, and how well it's working. And thanks for the case uh, the studies as well, the good cases as, that you shared. I think those are really important to uh, narrow down uh, the exact impact on individuals, which is awesome. So thanks for that. Thank you. I, I do see a, um, uh, a question here from Jane. No referrals are not needed. People can call and reach out on their own. The referrals are just an aid for somebody if they want their counselors to refer them, their caseworkers, or to help referral family members. But by all means, you do not need a referral. Thank you for that. And uh, we have two hands up right now. So Sarah, may I think you're up first? Hi, Inas. Thank you so much for such a well-rounded presentation. And I, I echo Hugo's comments. It's kind of, I can't believe it's been six years. Um, but this was really, you know, it kind of goes back a little farther than the, the Henny Committee, as you had um, referenced there. This is, this is a LIP initiative um, because we had created this business case for something like the Immigrant Health Clinic before we learned that Syrian refugees were arriving. And so it was really through some community engagement. Um, you know, your clinic is as a result of all of that engagement and it, it meets the needs that were voiced by the people. Um, I love that you included We Speak as well because it's the same thing. So what we had heard from um, the newcomer immigrant families when we spoke with them was we need help navigating the system. You have to coordinate yourselves and language continues to be a barrier. So I love this presentation and the case studies that show how, you know, when we collaborate and we come up with these solutions, look how far you can go. Mm -hmm. um, the question I have is, um, have you actually been able to um, match um, any of your patients with ongoing primary care, um, you know, sort of depending on where they live and what their needs are? Um, and have you seen a gap with um, We Speak being needed to, to follow those transitions? So with We Speak, um, a lot of the patients actually have, because once a patient comes and tells you all of their concerns, a lot of the times they're very hesitant to leave. 
So I do find that a lot of them just want to stay with the immigrant health clinic ongoing for primary care. Uh, I do have um, Jill here, as I introduced, who does also take primary care. She also speaks French. So a lot of our patients, for example, from the Congo, who also sp may speak French, um, go and see her. Um, I do try my very best that, for example, if a patient does speak Arabic, I try to refer them to an Arabic speaking primary care physician or nurse practitioner, if there is, I don't know if there is another one. Um, but we do try to connect them with um, offices that we know have that language. Um, it, it's not as easy as to do. For example, um, so especially when we send for specialists. So I have a patient who's going to, let's say for a urology, and there are no urologists that speak that language. Um, they have requested to maybe call us and have me translate or connect to that. But you know, when you're in an, a specialist office, it could be three hours um, before they're connected to the physician to actually see their visit for see them for like that five minutes. So it's very difficult to kind of connect and coordinate um, interpretation for them. Um, I have on one or two um, occasions done that for patients because they were stuck, but it, it was difficult to arrange that. Thank you so much for that updating us. Perhaps we can connect as well um, going forward now that the Lynn has made its trans transition to Ontario Health. Um, we'd be happy to help support any of those gaps that you're experiencing. Well done. Thank you. Um, there's a comment uh, from Ilda in the chat. Uh, uh, it says, our experience with VON has been great. The intake person, uh, Mo, uh, is very helpful. So I think a lot of us have wonderful experiences with the VON Immigrant Health Clinic, so uh, worth reinforcing that. Uh, and uh, Giselle, I think you have your hand up as well. Do you want to jump in? Yes, thanks, Hugo. Um, hi, I'm with um, ACFO, so it's a French association, and um, I was wondering, because I just had a call the other day from a Francophone family that have just arrived here, and they're looking for uh, a primary care physician. Um, I was going to refer, I, I did mention VON to them, and I was going to give them that information. Bonjour. <laughs> <laughs> So would I, um, would this be, we have a meeting in a few days and I was going to give them some referral information. Would it be, I don't know, with you um, to begin with and then be able to maybe find them or could they continue on with you as a nurse practitioner um, as uh, their uh, primary care worker? Absolutely, Giselle. Um, I do take Francophone patients of all ages. Um, no referral is needed. They can call the clinic. I will take them on as their primary care provider. And my program is a little bit different, uh, slightly from immigrant health, where they refer on to another provider. I very often uh, will keep all of my patients on as their primary care provider indefinitely. So absolutely, I'd be happy to take them on. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Wonderful. So I don't see any other hands up. Um, so I think I'm going to uh, move on. I think we're right on schedule with our agenda. So I don't want to set us back from there. Thank you so much. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, so next on, our, on, on that agenda is a um, presentation from uh, Ronnie from the YMCA. He's the outreach worker for the ONTAP program. Uh, he's going to give us an overview of the Ontario Newcomer Trades Action Program. Ronnie. Thank you, Hugo. I'm just going to share my screen here. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yep. Perfect. Uh, well, uh, thank you for having me this afternoon. I'm really excited to be talking about a, a very uh, a very important program that uh, the Y is uh, working on, the YMCA of Southwestern Ontario is teaming up with um, various Ys throughout the Ontario province. And um, what we're doing is, is really exciting. It's um, building a relationship between the skilled trades and newcomers specifically. Um, but before I go too much into it, I want to talk, I want to build a picture. I want to paint the picture rather. I want to talk a little bit about why is it that there's so much focus on the skilled trades? Why is it that, you know, um, there's a lot of 
emphasis on supporting the skill trades. It's because if you look into what's going on with the skill trades, you'll see that if we're not careful, we're approaching a situation that it can cause a lot of delay and cause um, a lot of complications in our community. So RBC uh, published a report in September of this year uh, called Powering Up, and they did uh, some research and studies about the skill trades in Canada. And as you can see, um, by a little bit... Uh, a little bit uh, more than six years from 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 now, over seven hundred thousand skilled trades people are expected to retire, and uh, immigrants, particularly, only are only comprise eight percent of the apprenticeships, despite accounting for more uh, more than twenty percent of the the population. And Canada, which has, uh, you know dedicated or uh, made the goal to bring in 3,000 skilled trades people annually through immigration has been has fallen short of that in 2019. Uh, no numbers yet of 2020, but you can see that we're, um, we're falling short. And then another element too is there's this, there's been this shift in the skilled trades. A lot of people think, you know, you get into the skilled trades, you don't, you don't need to know how to, you know, work uh, with with certain technologies or have soft skills, but you know that couldn't be further from the truth, right? There's a lot of um, there's a lot of change. There's uh, a lot of transformation in the skill traits. So certain things like creativity, creativity and problem solving are 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 now expected of skill trades workers. And if we zoom in a little bit more into our particular province, you can see you know we're not immune to what's going on um, in terms of skilled trade shortages. So in October 21, there was 316,000 vacant jobs and 24,000 of them were in manufacturing and um, a little bit less of 21,000 were in constructions. And the journey, the journey persons who are the men and women that are, that are teaching the apprenticeships and training them for their roles, one in three of them are over the age of 55. So again, approaching that that age of retirement and then the construction sector alone you know obviously I, um, as you all know the building of houses the maintenance of you know various buildings the carpentry the um the electricity and all the all that goes into the um um to the building of 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 of, of everything that we use um the construction sector which um, is a huge proponent of that is expecting 92,500 retirements by uh, by 2030. And um, again, that last statistic, statistic demonstrates how much of a gap there is between how many um, how many skilled trades workers we need and how many are, are projected to um, uh, to be active within the next um, within the next eight years. So again, you can see how big of a of a, of a situation there is. Um, and if we're not careful, it's not something that you know can be fixed overnight, and it's not something that any one person or any one organization can do alone. So with that. I'm excited to talk a little bit about ONTAP or the Ontario Newcomer Trades Action Program. And what we do is we connect with three different stakeholders. So we talk to community partners, many of you that are on the line today. We talk to the newcomers themselves and we talk to employers and we provide what it is they need for each one of those groups. At this point in time, it's information sharing. Make sure everybody's on that same level of, of information. But we also help connect um you know see what gaps there are in industry and what gaps there are in um you know in information or in, in guidelines and try to uh make up for those gaps and i want to zoom in a little bit uh, uh zoom in a little bit more so when we talk to service providers uh what we're trying to do is we're trying to instill greater confidence in their ability to advise clients about skilled trades opportunities and how we do that is we explain uh, what it looks like in their particular region so me specifically i represent london middlesex to windsor essex so i have this really unique opportunity to talk to service providers across this range um, and 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 discuss okay these are the skilled trades that are projected to uh to be in demand um you know these are the new programs that are coming out we also assist them in navigating uh if if they have a client that has foreign experience recognition and um as well as how to um, advocate or now or how to advise their clients for a, a viable career path and then we also talk to the newcomers themselves and must i say this has been extremely rewarding because i have mind you, a very small point, but an important point of challenging the narrative that the, that the skilled trades is a second class career choice. And it's not going to change overnight. But when I have an opportunity to talk to somebody and they say, wow, I, I didn't know what 
what exactly were the skilled trades and how important they are to the success of our, of our communities. So when we speak to the newcomers, we talk, of course, what are the skilled trades? You know, how do how, how can you begin the process of getting your trade certifications? You know, what are employers looking for? What's the difference between hard skills and soft skills? And of course, you know, the, the final piece of the puzzle are the employers themselves. And here we, we, we listen and we, we try to um, we try to assist them with recruit recruitment support, um, you know, try to connect them with different cultural and religious and ethnic groups. And we also tell them, you know, the importance of apprenticeships and how much opportunity and funding there are and assist them with the trades equivalency assessment. Um, this is a brief overview of, again, uh, a, a deeper dive into some of the uh, subjects that we speak about with each group. So as you can see, you can go from the labor market information to the success stories of newcomers, you know, uh, and, and, and what trades resources are available in their particular region. And then with the employers, uh, particularly what I think is, is, is really important is the cultural competence piece, talking about what it means to be diverse and inclusive. If you hire a newcomer, you don't automatically get a badge for being diverse or multicultural. There's a lot more that goes into it. And we talk about what exactly culture means and how we can support the employee as well as the employer. And you know it's been uh, it's been very very successful and you know at this point in time uh, all of our sessions are online but this is just a quick um, overview of um, some common questions we have um, if somebody is interested they're absolutely free um, at this time like I said they are um, they are mainly online we're able to accommodate different um, time constraints so anywhere between you know half an hour up to uh, an hour and a half. Who are they open to? Just about anybody, anybody who wants to learn about the skilled trades, wants to learn about how to possibly get into the skilled trades. And of course, you're more than welcome to check out our website if you'd like to book a session or talk a little bit more. But um, the the program that, that that's been created um, is is like I said, province wide, and has dedicated you know a, 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 you know nine hundred thousand dollars to connect nine hundred new immigrants again across our region. Um, so we're working with YMCA's in, in Toronto and in Ottawa and um, Simcoe Muskoka and it's it's very unique because we're able to really um, get a good understanding of the landscape. So what, like I mentioned earlier right now at, or at this point in time, particularly we are information sharing. We're trying to make those community connections. We're trying to uh, fill in you know gaps that we can. We're trying to see what what are the particular challenges of the each of each of the stakeholders and then we can go back and challenge leadership and say you know there needs to be a greater focus on this or there needs to be more you know a more emphasis on on tackling this particular challenge and then as you can see on tap tomorrow is left blank because at this point in time um you know we've we've applied for for further funding um uh and by we i mean uh, the leadership in ottawa for this project and what we hope is we can continue the information sharing, but also play an active role in the practical um, connection between newcomers and employers. So doing all the legwork for employers and assisting newcomers in developing the skills and learning uh, how to get into the skill trades, uh, making them feel comfortable through language, through education, through training, and then uh, working with the employers um, so that, you know, we can uh, we can pass them over to uh, an employer that needs newcomer that needs um, uh, that needs people to work and having that newcomer fill that spot and uh, begin that important relationship between between the two groups. So uh, more to come on that. Uh, hopefully, once we hear back, I'll be able to to share a little bit more. But the ONTAP today has been extremely successful. Um, and we've been able to meet with many service providers, newcomers, and um, and employers and uh, I'd like to say uh, you know it was so great to see so many uh, familiar uh, familiar faces um, on this call because you have all been a part of this success so you know I saw June and Maxine and Mark uh, Rakesh Rama and of course Jackie um, has 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 provided great insight and great uh, guidance as well but all of you have been so uh, you know you've been you've been a part of pushing the the skill trades conversation to the to the forefront which is really important so as you can see we have resources in different languages we've been able to have sessions uh and really connect with people um and you know what there's a lot more work that we're doing um 
earlier in November, we were able to um, we were able to have a roundtable discussion that had community partners, uh, friends from from London. Uh, Rakesh was was kind enough to let us use his boardroom, which was was which was really special because it gave us an opportunity to have very authentic uh, dialogue. And uh, Rakesh and the the chamber have been you know of great support. Uh, something that we're discussing now is a breakfast um uh with skilled trades employers and talking about um uh, talking about how um how we can bridge the gap between uh, employers and the recruitment process um we're hoping to to have it in person uh sometime next year but obviously with the changing situation of COVID, uh we're we're, we're um navigating that um and then uh before i move i can't talk about the success of on tap without uh putting a, a certain someone on spy, a spotlight and that is michelle suchu so michelle's been the person that's uh really really assisted me in you know these community connections and and, and um uh, assisting me with uh you know how we can get the skill trades out to the forefront uh with the breakfast as you can see we lip is is a very proud partner um so thank you for your um, um thank you thank you for your partnership and thank you michelle for uh for being there every step of the way and this large success is 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 a large part because of your dedication so uh with that uh, I, I invite any questions or comments and uh if there's anything that i can ever assist or um if there's anything that particular is interesting for you or your organization i'm more than happy to to navigate that here is my um, contact information and uh, i'd be more than happy to um, entertain any questions or comments thank you very much Thank you, Ronnie. Um, that was, uh, that was a, I have to say that I, I know um, the conversation of getting newcomers into the skill trades has been ongoing for a lot of years. And uh, it's good to see a lot of different champions emerge over the years. I know Wes has done some great work. You've mentioned some of the others that are on the call now. Uh, lots of champions and, and it's good to see more of that momentum. I think your articulation of the big uh, macro level picture of what's coming down um, you know, years down the line, if we don't address this, is one of the best I've heard. Uh, so thanks for that. That was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, and your PowerPoint is very mesmerizing. <laughs> um, Thank you. So very good. Um, so I'm going to uh, see if anybody has. Oh, I see Catherine. Um, I see her uh, hand up. You want to jump yeah, hi. Um, I was just thinking when I was listening to what you were saying, um, how true it is, you know, uh, about all those industries. And um, is there uh, a definition for the program with regard to like, what is the definition of new immigrant or newcomer? Where I'm going with that is I'm thinking teenagers in high school and getting through to kids um, at a guidance office level so that they can get some sage advice about career decisions. Um, so, like, is there an age or, you know, you've been in the country for a year or what, what is the parameter of the definition of newcomer in terms of say, reaching out to youth? Thank you, Catherine, for that question. No, it's, it's, you're absolutely right. We've kept it really open. We've kept that, 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 that uh, uh, you know the uh, the definition of newcomer very open is it somebody that came to the country recently or somebody that's been here for a long time um so in terms of reaching out to high schools and and and, and um, guidance counselors that is in the works i i know rama's on this call uh she's been extremely helpful in that regard with the windsor essex catholic school board so we were able to present to some of their students there's conversations about uh you know presenting to guidance counselors because when I was speaking about uh, really challenging that that narrative that the second that the skilled trades is a second class career choice, it's important that it's a generational conversation. And with you know, with a lot of the newcomers that I've been able to connect with, some say maybe this is not something that I'm particularly um, going to pursue, but. I'm now more confident in my son or daughter becoming a skilled trades person. Whereas in different parts of the world, there isn't that confidence, right? You have to be a doctor, lawyer, or, um, or engineer. Those are the three categories, right? Whereas by, by reaching the younger generations, we're able to challenge that in a generational way. And a lot of the outreach that we do when we talk about apprenticeships, um, we talk about the OYAP program. So the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program. So obviously that's more geared towards high school students and, um, 
and, and, and youth. So yes, we've been able to we've been able to connect to uh, with the diff with the different groups. But just going back to your original uh, question, newcomer is completely open. If they self identify as a newcomer, they're more than welcome to be a part of this conversation. That's great, and and I believe so. It, provincial funding, I think that makes some it makes a distinction from what we're used to with the IRCC funding. Is that correct, Ronnie? Yes. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. That's a great question, um, Kelsey. Thanks, Hugo, and thanks, Ronnie. It's great to have an update, and and likewise, I mean, one uh, to Monica's comment in the chat about. Uh, PowerPoint Envy, yeah, it's there. Um, and similar to Catherine, uh, I've been doing some work uh, and Workforce has been doing some work to explore um, experiential learning opportunities. And one of the conversations that I had with an educator was just this Monday, um, talking about wanting to connect newcomer youth in our schools um, to apprenticeship opportunities through employers um, that have begun businesses as newcomers or immigrants themselves to allow for, you know, that cultural connection to happen, that linguistic connection to happen um, at the same time that uh, the employment knowledge is being shared and that experience is being developed. So is that something, um, you know, that you're, you're working on or those conversations that you're having through on tap right now is, is seeing what capacity exists and maybe some of our longer standing um, organizations or companies locally, as well as trying to identify some of those newcomer owned or immigrant owned businesses in the skilled trades as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Kelsey, that's, Kelsey, that's a great question. And uh, before I go further, when I was, uh, reading my list of thank yous, I foolishly forgot you off it. And I apologize because you've been, you've been helpful with the We Value project. So thank you for that. We met earlier. So um, oh, Ronnie, that's been, we are so good. Don't I think, but you know, th that's great. And when I talk about success stories, you know, I was, I, I was recently told by, by somebody, uh, you can't be what you can't see. Right. So if you have an opportunity for, uh, to us to present new, uh, sorry, if we have an opportunity to present success stories or to highlight organizations that are, um, that were, that are led by newcomers or are accepting newcomers, then we can, it's an easy, it's a seamless transition in, right? And that would hopefully try to, um, encourage or motivate or inspire other organizations to do that. So what I'm trying to do uh, is, is, is I'm compiling a list of all the different organizations or employers that I've been able to connect with and the ones that, you know, oh, wow, you're, uh, you have a very unique story. And I think your story is going to be extra powerful. I don't mean to put Rakesh on the spot, but when I was able to meet with him and he spoke about his own personal story. And I think that's so important because when a newcomer is able to, to listen to that and understand that they're not alone and that this is something that even somebody like Rakesh, who's a community leader now has been able to navigate and overcome, there's hope for them. So yeah, I am compiling a list and I am still seeking out all those different newcomer champions. Wonderful. So, you know, I'm going to connect with you afterwards anyway, but uh, I, I'm glad to hear that that list is in development. I know that uh, there are a lot of people working to connect uh, youth to uh, experiential learning opportunities that would be happy to see that and support uh, that dissemination. Thanks. That'd be great. Thank you. Great stuff. And, and Ronnie, I'm glad you, you, you uh, brought up uh, Rakesh's story. Um, story. I, I think it was my first or second year at the Y working with Michelle, actually, uh, with the International Trade Professional Conference when that was still uh, a year of the event, uh, and he was our keynote speaker. And I still, to this day, think about that story uh, pretty often, uh, how remarkable it is, uh, you know, uh, what he uh, went through and the experience and the resilience of that. So, uh, yeah, it, that's a huge, a, a huge impact to newcomers who are in that phase of their journey. So uh, and there's just a one quick question in the chat. I think it's uh, Rochelle. Uh, is the training provided in English and French uh, or is it only English? It's, it's available in, in English and French and different languages. I have a presentation in London that will be in Arabic on Friday. So, uh, and then we have one of our colleagues that will be doing Farsi, Spanish. So uh, if there is a particular language, we will try our best to, to accommodate that. In terms of the, um, in terms of the material, uh, I, I work with different organizations to see what languages they need. So a lot of our material has been translated in obviously French, English, Spanish, Somali, uh, uh, Arabic, and Mandarin. Amazing. That, that's so good to hear. Thanks so much, Ronnie. Really appreciate uh, your time uh, and uh, the presentation. So thank you. Um, so next on our, our, on our agenda, uh, someone who's no stranger to uh, the LIP and uh, most of us here, um, Tash Lenteski from 
uh, Workforce Windsor Essex. She's the manager of projects and research here to talk about the career investment tools. Uh, Tasha. Thanks, Hugo, uh, and thank you all for having me. Um, I know you guys have had a pretty jam-packed agenda, so I hope this won't be too strenuous, and I know you're getting to your election results, so I will keep it quick. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, so this afternoon, I wanna quickly um, run through some of the new tools that we've created, I guess, not as new now, um, but they're career investment tools that we were able to create in partnership with Legro. Um, so these tools that we created um, earlier this year, here we go. Um, we originally wanted them to uh, be able to address layoffs and those that are being um, unemployed due to the ongoing pandemic. Um, but we're seeing a lot of um, benefits that others can have, just the general job seekers, students, youth, um, and career changers as well. So I'm actually just gonna do a demo of the tools because I think that's gonna be kind of the easiest way um, to walk everyone through them. Um, but the first tool is our training board. Um, so I'm sure some of you have heard of this before. I know I've done a couple demos previously, um, but essentially this is very similar to our job board, um, but we actually have it um, focusing on training opportunities. And these are short-term training opportunities. So anything less than one year, um, but these can be credentialed programs through a college or university, um, non-credentialed programs or certificate certificates such as SmartServe, um, WMIS, First Aid, anything like that. Um, but there's an opportunity for training providers to actually post um, the opportunity themselves. Um, oh, so you can find uh, both these resources that I'm gonna talk about just right on our homepage. Um, so the training board and career calculator, which I'll get to next. Um, but this is what the training board looks like. So again, very similar to our job board. Um, so right now you can see there's 68 training opportunities available right now. Um, if anyone is just kind of perusing to see what training is available, um, it is put in order by date of when the next session would be held. Um, so as you can see, uh, as of today, there is a requirements to apply for Canadian citizenship session um, being held by the YMCA. Um, and then you kind of just keep scrolling and find what's on there. Um, so the great thing about this, um, similar to a lot of our tools, is if anyone is interested in, say, this session here, they simply click Go to Training Opportunity, and it will bring them back to where that um, posting is originally from or where the training provider has linked any sort of application, registration form, anything like that. Um, so anyone looking to provide, or sorry, um, update or upload a training opportunity, they simply click Submit a New Opportunity. Um, and this form will come up. So they put in information about their company or organization, any basic information about the training, so a description of what the session would look like um, or any sort of curriculum uh, requirements. They would update the schedule. So whether it's something that's just a one day quick session, something that's maybe four months, um, they can input that. Any other details? Um, and they can also include tags. So this is particular um, to what occupations or skills would be taught in this training session. Um, so we do provide um, kind of, a, think of the word, like a self-finishing sentence. Um, so as you type in any sort of knock um, options that will kind of finish it for you, um, any skills, it will, still, it will suggest skills to you um, as well. And you can put all of that information in there uh, to submit your opportunity. Um, so as this would be a short-term option, um, I'm assuming only today, um, this would be uh, expired uh, later today and disappear. Um, so if you have new opportunities, you always kind of need to update things or you can tell um, the system that it's a recurring event and fill it in that way. Any users um, can actually search by keywords. So for instance, home support, and it'll filter it for you and show you um, opportunities available. So there's one opportunity for home support worker training session starting uh, tomorrow, and you can see here it's four weeks. Um, anyone can simply um, filter it also by delivery method. So for instance, um, online, in class, or both. Um, the time commitment, so anything from less than one day to over a month. The cost, so from anything from no cost to over $500. Um, and the credential. So again, whether it's non-credentialed, formal training, or post-secondary certificate. Um, so this is a really great way to see kind of in one place all the training that's taking place locally, um, but it's also a great way for us to see what's missing, what are the gaps uh, in current training. 
I'm just gonna jump down to our career calculator. Um, so this is a return on investment tool for anyone that's considering uh, entering formal education or making a career change. They can see what the time or financial commitment would be for that change. Um, so I'm just gonna run through an example. Um, so you would start off by putting in your current occupation or you can do this as a service provider with a client. Um, so for example, a food server. And like I mentioned before, it'll kind of um, finish the sentence for you. So you can put that in there. Um, if you're working with someone or a user doesn't have any previous employment, they simply just check that box and it'll fill this in for them. Um, they can put in their current age and planned retirement age. Um, these are just default settings. They can be changed um, to anything you would like. Um, and then uh, current yearly income. So I'll put in 25,000. Um, the next stage would be where they would um, be able to put in their target occupation. So anything that they're um, considering changing into or considering a training opportunity for. Um, do an accountant. And so when you put in uh, that target occupation, we also uh, provide any sort of wage information that we have. Um, so it will autofill with the 25th percentile. So this is gonna be kind of the lower end of a pay scale, typically someone that's entry level um, or just getting started. But you can kind of select any others um, if for instance, somebody has uh, more experience. It also includes the inflation rate, which we have as default according to StatsCan as 1.9. That can be changed, but we typically uh, promote using the default. So the next step would be uh, looking at education. So based on the NOT code uh, that was put in as the target occupation, it will provide you with the full list of any sort of post-secondary education offered locally that relates to that job. Um, so for instance, we have opportunities here from both uh, University of Windsor and St. Clair College. Um, so for instance, we'll go with actuarial science. It'll autofill the tuition, duration, program commitment, um, and then you can input any living costs that you might have, the income that you're earning while going to school, um, and any grants or subsidies. So we'll just say this person working part-time. And so once you put in all of this information, um, it will take it in and assess, essentially, um, if you didn't make the change, how much money would you um, earn cumulatively over time? So for instance, in this example, as a server, um, they would earn, uh, by the time they required, cumulatively um, almost $650,000. However, as an accountant, they're looking closer to 1.5 million. So this is gonna show that the return on investment is a positive 122%. It would take in this rule, or sorry, in this new position based on tuition, seven years to pay back that fees. Um, and here's the difference um, that they would make between those jobs. The great thing also that we have in here is the job posting activity. So this will show um, that even if they have a really good positive return on investment by the target occupation they've chosen, they should also look to see if there's actual job availability in Windsor Essex. Um, so this is a pretty positive in demand job. We have currently 11 active postings for accountants or financial auditors. And we also show a list of the historical um, companies that have hired for this position. Um, so this can really give some narrative to uh, the story as well. Um, so this is a really great tool, like I said, for anyone considering a job change or their first career. Like I mentioned with the um, starting point of current occupation, you can select no previous employment and it will um, kind of null all of this information and you can uh, calculate with that as well. I think it froze. Well, sorry about that, um, but that was a very quick run through um, of how to use these career investment tools. Um, so like I mentioned, this is a really great uh, way that can benefit a lot of job seekers um, and students at once um, as they kind of explore different opportunities. 
um, that was very quick and I think I'm still slightly over time, uh, but is there any questions um, about these tools? That was amazing. That's, uh, that's very impressive and another great tool from Workforce Windsor Essex. Um, I know Stephen is very curious if a uh, professional hockey player is uh, a not code. He's planning for his son's future and his own retirement, I think. I think athletes in here, so you could probably put it in. I wouldn't suggest it because I'm sure it's really high, but there's probably no job postings for it. So. <laughs> True. Um, does anybody else have any other questions, um, comments? Hey, this is, uh, <laughs> I think we're all being entertained here by, by Steve and uh, his plans and uh, for, for his son. Um, really, really great tool. Uh, thank you for that so much, uh, Tashlin. I always, always so great to see uh, the stuff that comes out of workforce and just really practical stuff um, and, and simple to use. And I think that's the beauty of what uh, the balance that you strike with with your tools. I, I am. I'm, I think we're all always just so impressed by it. Um, and Olivia has found the code maybe five two five one. So I think I'm assuming this is for Hudson. I think Hudson is gonna it's gonna do some homework tonight. So yeah, thank you so much. If anyone's looking for kind of a slower run through a demo with any of your staff or clients, uh, please just reach out either through myself or Michelle or anyone on the team, uh, and we can set that up for you guys. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Um, okay, so we are going to um, move on to our WeLib uh, executive elections. So I'm going to throw it over to Mary Ellen Bernard, our WeLib project manager and manager for social policy and planning at the City of Windsor. Mary Ellen. Thanks, Hugo. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. So nice to see so many people on this call, and it's been such a great, great meeting with so much great information. Um, I asked for an uh, extra couple of minutes uh, on the agenda today. And I, I, as you heard at the beginning of our meeting, our chair, Hugo, is retiring from us. <laughs> not from life, not from work, <laughs> just, from, <laughs> just from the lip. Um, so he's left the YMCA and he's going to be the new director of equity, diversity, and inclusion at the Children's Aid Society. And, um, you know, I have to tell you, this is a pretty bittersweet moment for us. Uh, well, we firmly believe, and he knows this, that he was like tailor-made for this position. It's still, uh, it's still pretty hard on all of us because he's been a part of the LIP for such a long time. Um, and he's going to do incredibly important work, and I know you'll be highly successful, Hugo, at the Y. Um, but I, it was really important that we take a few moments and acknowledge all the work that he has done with the LIP since over the past uh, many years. So Hugo started as a WeLIP member at least 10 years ago. I couldn't go back any further than that, but I know it's been at least 10 years. In 2012, he was elected as a member at large. In 2014, he was elected as a vice chair. And in 2016, and then again in 2018, he was elected as chair, which is the position that he leaves today when, as he goes to the Y, as he goes to the CAS. Over the past 10 years, um, we have welcomed his willingness to share his knowledge, his practicality, and I use that word very, uh, very uh, distinctly because he's always got his feet on the ground and he's always thinking about what can be done in our community. And the insights which were always layered with an optimism that the system, as we all know it to be, can be improved to enhance the settlement experience for all newcomers. One thing in particular that I really treasured about working with Hugo as chair was that he always remembered that WeLIP is not an agency. Mm -hmm. We are a community planning body. We are a collective of organizations. We are individuals. And we strive to use communication and research and collaboration to help, reach, to help the community reach its goals. So it's, it's just been such a, an honor to be working with Hugo as he always was part of a team. Even when he was showing leadership, he was part of a team that we could all be working in the same road together. So it's just been, it's just been such an honor to be working with him. 
And one of the highlights that I certainly want to, to bring forward is uh, his leadership with the We Value Project, because it has literally transformed the capacity of organizations to conduct assessments with newcomers. This in turn has given these organizations the research and the tools to, to better assist clients for the long term using a more comprehensive and holistic approach, which helps the clients and the staff, and really it's the betterment of our community. So on behalf of the WeLIP and the staff and all you members <laughs> and members who are not here today, I just want to thank Hugo for his dedication to the WeLIP and its work and to wish you great success in your new position. Oh, that's a lovely. <laughs> That was a great. See, I didn't even know the team was going to do this, and it's wonderful. Oh. So, <laughs> can I just say thank you? I'm, I'm, um, thank you. That that was so beautiful and kind. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm deserving of that. Um, you said something that I think made me think of how to respond. And I think you know, the lib isn't a uh, an organization; it is a collective. And I think any, um, ooh, interesting. Um, any success that I can um, think of that I've been a part of is, is a collective as well. And uh... how about if I go on to the next part of my talk? <laughs> <laughs> Collect your thoughts on that. Thank you. So, okay. Uh, you can come back though. We can come back to you. It's like uh, we're going to, you can call a friend or whatever. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, the second part of my job here today was to announce the results of the recent election for members of the WeLIP executive. I'm going to leave you in suspense for like uh, two minutes because first I would really like to thank our members of our team, Monica and Alana, I know they're on our call here, who organized and carried out a virtual election, which required individual ballots to go to 81 organizations. If you can't really visualize what an enormous job that is, please take a moment and visualize that. So it, it's an absolutely huge job, but I really wanna thank Monica, at, excuse me, and Alana for figuring all this out, for fixing the glitches that came up and, and just moving forward and carrying it out so well. So thank you very much to both of you. Okay, as noted, the ballots went to 81 organizations. We had 39 responses, so we had a response rate of about 48%. Uh, okay, Michelle says that's about par for uh, a virtual election. Uh, you always hope to see more. I do come from a political science background, so you always hope to see more. Um, so on behalf of the WeLIP, we would like to thank everyone who... Uh, who voted and who allowed their names to be uh, put forward as nominations. It was so very much appreciated. For the position of chair of the WeLIP, two persons agreed to let their names stand, Charlotte LaFranc and Stephanie Lianga. The WeLIP membership selected Charlotte LaFranc for the position of chair. For the member at large position, four people agreed to let their names stand, Marion Fentetti, Ronnie Hadar, Dismas Nuzei Yamana and Nadini Tuyumala. The WeLIP membership selected Marion Fintetti for the position of member at large. Again, we want to thank everyone who agreed to let their name stand and everyone who took the time to vote. It is so much appreciated, and we welcome you to the executive. Thank you very much. I had no idea who uh, had won the elections actually or what the results were. So that is a pleasant surprise and uh, such a wonderful uh, change of uh, executive. Um, I have to say uh, it's been a really uh, interesting time for me uh, reflecting on my 10 years uh, in the sector and with the we live and it's I'm just not the same person I was when I started in the sector and I'm very grateful for everyone that I've been able to work with. Um, I uh, just uh, just so so grateful and then there just are no words. Uh, so it's been a real honor and I hope to continue to work with as many of you as possible. I know that's already started. Uh, the work here is one uh, that uh, is both looking in inwardly and internal to what we can do, but also, you know, understanding and knowing how important we are in our partnerships and, and looking externally to, um, you know, the, the role that we play externally uh, or in the community uh, to, to bring about equity for, um, 
for marginalized communities. So really looking forward to that. It's been such an honor and uh, very grateful for that opportunity, but also great to see new leadership and, and, and continued leadership from others. Uh, congratulations to those that won uh, in, in this election. Uh, the LIP is in great hands and it's, it's, it's such a beautiful and wonderful place for, for uh, this community to move, uh, work along. And um, yeah, very excited to, to continue to track with the work and, uh, and see the new executive uh, composition uh, move some, some great things forward. Um, so thank you for that. Congratulations. Uh, I think maybe to close off or at least to go into other business, I will formally pass on the baton to Charlotte. Congratulations, are you on? I don't see you on my screen, but feel free to jump in um, as our new chair. Thank you very much, Hugo, and thank you to all of the membership for your confidence. I feel like I have really, really, really big shoes to fill. It's certainly been an honor to serve alongside you, and thank you for your incredible leadership, Hugo. And um, I don't want to gloat, but I'm really excited to have you close by to draw on. So we're so um, thrilled to have you as part of the CAS family. It, it's only been a matter of weeks, and yet it feels like it's it's been much longer because you've just really integrated into the fabric of our organization. So thankful that I will have your wisdom to draw on in, in guiding me and, and, and filling your very big shoes and serving this incredible collective. So thank you very much. And now you get to close the meeting. <laughs> I do? <laughs> Oh, wow. This is very exciting. It's a good thing I did my hair today. <laughs> Charlotte, if I, if I can just jump in for a second. Sure, please, Michelle. Anything you'd like to, to add before we close? Yeah. Um, I'm not even going to thank Hugo because I can't. I'll, I'll cry. Yeah. So I'm joining you, Hugo. Um, but, uh, you know, thank you all for your participation today. This really speaks to, to the engagement of, of our partners, our council members, and, um, you know, the diversity of sectors that, that are represented on our council really speaks strongly. Um, Mary Ellen, you know, touched on the point about uh, our uh, election, you know, the participation level. But, you know, that I do believe that's really good for a virtual uh, election. And yes, uh, kudos to Monica and Alana for, for handling that individual unique links going out to each and every one of your organizations is how that happened. Um, and it, it, it took many hours and problem solving. Mm -hmm. And our, our colleague Tash Lenteski uh, at Workforce was also very instrumental in that. So we appreciate her support. Um, also, I would like to point out that, you know, everyone that put their, their names forward that agreed to have their names uh, put forward for our election, you know, kudos to you. Um, this is the first time in the history of our LIP that we've had so many uh, nominees, which really speaks to the engagement and the commitment that you all have for our community. So thank you once again for that. And um, Charlotte, we look forward to uh, your leadership. And Marion, we look forward to you joining the executive as a member at large. And um, we look forward to seeing everybody at our community forum coming up February 8th, and there'll be more details to follow on that. Um, but Charlotte, I turn it back to you on the spot if there's anything else you want to say. Um, I also am feeling a little bit of all of the emotions here with the big transition, but um, mostly just grateful. So, so much gratitude for this incredible group and the commitment here. And I think we would be remiss as a collective if we didn't give some love and appreciation to our incredible We Lip team, to Alana, to Monica, to Mary Ellen, and to, of course, the incredible Michelle for all that you do. Um, you are the wizard behind the We Lip curtain and you, you just uh, make this all work. So we're so, so thankful to you and to everybody that engaged in this process. And uh, with that, we say thank you and we wish everyone um, a safe holiday season. Many, many wonderful, happy Hanukkah to those that finished celebrating this week um, and uh, much love and, and many blessings to everyone. And we'll officially close the meeting uh, with thanks and, and we'll look forward to seeing everyone in the new year. Charlie, can I just take a quick, really, really quick second? Oh, please, by all means. <laughs>
And, and only just because I think as we're saying, thank you. Um, I know Murray is, uh, or was on the call. I think you believe, I believe he still is. I think others from IRCC. Um, I am always been so grateful for how supportive our local uh, IRCC officers are uh, and for the funding they provide for, for the local immigration partnership. And I think this is such a perfect example of what this, this funding was intended to do. Uh, and over the years, I think it's just continued to prove itself and it's helped uh, I think inspire others in, in the country to do that. And I think it's really important to, to recognize funders that, that can take some risk, uh, that give us uh, the freedom that they do to do some of this work. Um, and I know it's incredibly important and sometimes for, whether we like it or not, it, it can be done without that support. So thank you to Murray uh, and others uh, for, our RCC for that support. Thank you, Murray. Yeah, Thanks, good Hugo. Call, Hugo. Hugo, I didn't know we'd be saying goodbye again. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I think your um, emotional moment there is uh, reflective of how much this work uh, meant to you and means to you. So congratulations in your new uh, position and welcome Charlotte and everyone else. Uh, look sure. forward to working with you. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. And thank you for all that you do, Murray. You go above and beyond, and we we certainly well, appreciate. It's my job. <laughs> <laughs> well, we certainly appreciate that. So, any other last comments or thanks? I think this is a good way to go out. I wish all meetings ended with this this kind of a wonderful warmth. Um, any parting comments before we officially bring things to a close? All Maybe right. just an applaud for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can all give ourselves a round of applause. There you go. Thanks for that, Maxine. <laughs> well, or maybe, thank you. We should, maybe we should, at, at the end of every meeting, just like take a time to thank everyone. Because <laughs> I think everyone is doing something great for the community. And like, we don't take the time to pause and say thank you. So here we go. Thank you all for your great job. Thank I love you. it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. and thank you, Hugo. May your voice always be resonating in all of our heads through mm. every meeting from here on in. That's right. And we're going to keep him on the council. We're not letting him get too, too far away. So he will still be around. So, <laughs> so we'll, 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 we'll keep him close to our, to our hearts and he will still be definitely close to the work. So, all right. Well, with that, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful, safe, and happy holidays, and, and thank you to everybody. As Hussein said, a big thanks to everyone. Big thanks, everyone. Bye, Take everyone. care, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy, happy holidays. holidays.